Well, shalom, everybody. My name is Todd Bennett, and this is the weekly uh, audio recording of the Shema Israel newsletter titled, Let the Righteous Rejoice. The Salvation of Yahuwah Has Been Revealed. Well, this was originally published as the written newsletter on day 18 of month 7 on the Creator's calendar, otherwise known as October 15th, 2022 on the Roman calendar. I'm currently in Jerusalem celebrating day four of the Feast of Sukkot, also known as the Feast of Ingathering. And I'm so thankful to be back. Honestly, I wasn't sure I would re be returning um, anytime soon, the way things were headed, but Yah is good, and I'm truly rejoicing. And I hope you're all able to celebrate this appointed time with true joy as well. And I mentioned last week how Sukkot is a time to rejoice. Uh, the reason why this time is so joyful is because it is the rehearsal for a royal wedding between Yeshua and his bride. And if you think about the patterns that Yahuwah provides, it becomes very clear. One of the most joyous occasions in a person's life is their wedding. And, well, probably the saddest time would be, you know, the death of their spouse or a child. So when we celebrate Sukkot, we should consider the themes of a Hebrew wedding because that is the culmination of the renewal of the covenant with Israel, the divorced and exiled bride. So from our own life experiences, uh, we can understand the emotions and the joy that we're supposed to be experiencing and that we will experience in the future. Now, there are variations on the theme, but generally the ancient Hebrew wedding process began with the selection of the bride. The bride was then acquired through a covenant. Terms were negotiated and written down, and the gift or, or Price was agreed upon and sealed with a meal, which would involve the shedding of blood. This was known as the betrothal. Uh, the Hebrew word for acquire is not used in the sense of a slave or possession. It was first used by Hava uh, after she conceived and bore Cain. Uh, she stated that, I have acquired a man from Yahuwah. In the same sense, when a man acquired a bride, it was a special relationship treated as a gift from Yahuwah. Uh, the wedding occurred after the betrothal, after the groom had prepared a place for his bride. And we can view the appointed times and the actions of Yeshua within this general framework. And that's why it was no coincidence that the first recorded miracle of Yeshua occurred during the wedding. He had people pour into the empty stone jars that were used. They poured water into the empty stone jars that were used for waters of purification. Just yesterday I was uh, up in uh, Tel Megiddo in uh, uh, northern Israel, and I was showing some people some examples of stone jars. Uh, the stone jars were empty because the bride had washed with those waters prior to the wedding. When Yeshua turned the water into wine, he was revealing that his bride would be cleansed and purified by his bride. The wine was the best because it represented his shed blood. Remember when he said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day? For my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Well, that freaked a lot of people out uh, because they just didn't comprehend what he was talking about. But he clarified his meaning at the Passover when he renewed the covenant and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he, and he was referring to the bread. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, uh, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the renewed covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, if this uh, message wasn't any clearer, the event took place at Cana, which means to acquire and to be zealous or jealous. <clears throat> By no coincidence, the coat lands 
when there's plenty of new wine available after the recent grape harvest. And that makes rejoicing especially enjoyable and easy for people. And it is actually incredible that we serve an Elohim who's concerned with all of those details. Yeshua made a powerful statement at the Cana wedding, and if we follow him, we can be part of his bride. He already paid the price for the betrothal. So we rejoice because we can participate in that prophesied wedding event. And it's critical to understand that the dwelling place of the newlyweds will be in the covenant land. Uh, the scriptures in Isaiah say, You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed uh, desolate, but you shall be called Hephzibah, and your land Beulah. For Yahuwah delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall Elohim rejoice over you. And this is why Zechariah tells of the future when the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, will be required. Celebration for all the nations. It's the anniversary celebration of the king and his bride. And we read about that in Zechariah. It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Israel, Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king. Yahuwah of hosts, and to keep the feast of Sukkot. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahuwah of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which Yahuwah strikes the nations who do not come up to the feast of Sukkot, to keep the feast of Sukkot. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Sukkot. Now, I heard something very interesting this week. Uh, William Shatner, who is best known as Captain Kirk on Star Trek, uh, went up into space for a very brief period of time a year ago. Instead of feeling joyful, <coughs> he stated in a recent uh, book that uh, he cried and felt great grief for the planet. Uh, he said that he discovered that the beauty isn't out there. It's down here with all of us, and I'm quoting him. Now that was quite a reversal for a man who spent most of his life popularizing the notion of exploring space and discovering new worlds. And it just so happens that on the flight uh, over to Israel, uh, recently, I was watching a documentary on the James Webb Telescope and the scientists involved in uh, exoplanetary uh, uh, exploration. These scientists were uh, spending their entire adult lives looking for another planet like Earth. And I, I found that to be kind of sad as well because these people were spending all of their energy on something that's so far beyond their grasp and their present lives. They won't know for certain if their speculations about habitable planets are true. They're just making guesses based upon distances from suns and the gases that they perceive from light bands. And, you know, even if they were certain one of the planets were habitable, it couldn't be reached uh, in their lifetimes at least or in any reasonable amount of time for that matter. Take, for instance, uh, Proxima b, which apparently orbits the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri. Uh, that trip is a mere 4.25 light years away. And with current propulsion technology, estimated travel time is 78,000 years. Well, there's no Enterprise spaceship to take them there at warp speed, and unless, of course, the Nephilim show up, posing as aliens. Nothing would surprise me at this point in time, but... Barring any close encounters of the fifth kind, we simply don't have the mainstream transportation to make interstellar travel a possibility. Uh, various theoretical technologies could possibly reduce it uh, to a century or even 20 years, but even then, who's going to spend 20 years of their life traveling to another planet? And, and then again, why? Uh, you know, we have limited lifespans, and we have a beautiful home here that the Creator has provided, and it's 
it's sad that people fail to see and appreciate that beauty. And it's interesting that William Shatner finally did after idolizing space travel for most of his life. Uh, you know, the stated goal of these scientists is to find life somewhere other than Earth or find a place that we can move to as if we need a man-made escape plan, as if it's, uh, we're desperate to get off this planet. And again, I find that sad. And Hollywood has been glamorizing this idea for years. And it's, a, it's conditioning people to almost give up on this planet, as if there's something better out there. And, uh, and you know, focus on space as the hope for our future. And have you noticed that trend? It's been permeated into modern religions. And uh, many Christians spend their post-salvation existence anticipating being raptured or going to heaven. They plan on leaving this planet and never returning, and they completely fail to understand the concept of renewal in the plan of Elohim. Uh, while they believe that Messiah is returning, they fail to understand why. Of course, yes, it, it's to redeem and deliver his people, but it, it's not to transplant them onto a cloud for all eternity. Uh, he's also coming to punish the rulers of evil. He will judge the planet in preparation for his rule over this planet. He is, after all, the Aleph and the Ta, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He was there at the beginning, and he will be there at the end, or should I say at the renewal, because there will be a renewed heaven and a renewed earth, after all. He's going to judge and then renew uh, his creation, just like we read about in Genesis 1-2. He placed the Garden of Eden, uh, which was paradise, here on earth. And he will do it again through the renewed Jerusalem. The renewed Jerusalem will descend upon a renewed earth. And we read that in Revelation 21-10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the set-apart Jerusalem, descending out of the heavens from Elohim. The appointed times that we are rehearsing are all about that renewal event. Even the city of Jerusalem is a pattern for the future Mount Zion, the renewed Jerusalem. And that's why Yahuwah dwelled in Jerusalem and commanded people to come and celebrate him three times a year. Uh, celebrate with him and worship him three times a year and that's why we come here for the feasts during Sukkot we dwell in Sukkot for seven days representing the seven millennia of this current covenant plan remember that with Yahuwah one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day according to 2 Peter 3 8 the seventh day of the feast is called Hoshana Rabbah the last great day, or the great salvation. And that's why Yeshua specifically chose that day to invite people to him. In John 7, we read, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the set-apart spirit was not yet given, because Yeshua was not yet glorified. Yeshua was referencing, referencing Isaiah 55, which says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you have no, who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages? For what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not uh, know you shall run to you because of Yahweh your Elohim and is set apart one of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek Yahuwah while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to Yahuwah, and he will have mercy on him, and to, to our Elohim, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are, are your ways my ways, says Yahuwah. Well, I have to admit that I was raised with a very sloppy understanding of Yahuwah and his son. I was essentially taught that I could just pray whenever I wanted, and he was always there for me at my disposal. It's actually a very selfish and Western approach to a relationship with Elohim that lacked the essential fear of Yahuwah that we should all have because he's the king. He gave us earthly kings as examples, and you don't just walk into the throne room and interrupt the king whenever you feel like it. And you make petitions, and then you come and present them when you're invited to see the king. And that's why the appointed times are so essential. Did you catch the reference to them uh, in the passage in Isaiah? It says, Seek Yahuwah while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Well, he invites us to meet with him at his appointed times. They are his times, and we should plan around his schedule. Uh, sadly, some people think the Yahuwah should operate around their own schedule, and they end up missing the appointments. And when we neglect or intentionally fail to appear when summoned by the king, it has consequences. And I can tell you that it will have serious consequences in the future. That's why I encourage people not to play around with the calendar. We need to be on his calendar as described in Genesis 1.14 without adding or taking away from it. Isaiah 55 is then followed by this statement. Thus says Yahuwah, keep justice and do righteousness. For my salvation, which is Yeshua, uh, in Hebrew, is about to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. That's in Isaiah 56, 1. This is a command and a warning. The word to keep, for keep, is shamar. It means to watch over and guard. And the Hebrew word for do is asa. And it's an action verb, and it can even be defined as make. So we're supposed to make righteousness through the way we live our lives. The Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua, as I said, and that makes us think of the name of the Son. But don't forget that the Son also carries the name of the Father. That's why his name is not just Yeshua, salvation, it is Yahushua, Yah saves. Yahu is how the name of the Father is included in many Hebrew names, such as Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, Mathis Yahu, Matthew, and of course, Yahushua, Joshua. Yahushua revealed himself on the seventh day of Sukkot as the salvation provided by Yahuwah. And we must be sure that we're drinking from his waters. You see, Babylon provides drink for thirsty people as well. Uh, we read in Revelation 17, 1 through 2, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Well, we need to make sure that we are not quenching our thirst in Babylon. And do you notice the emphasis on sevens? when dealing with the judgment upon Babylon? Seven is the number associated with Yahuwah, and there, will be, and there will be no mistake where that judgment is coming from. And that's why Yahuwah chose the seventh month for the future rehearsals involving judgment and salvation. Traditionally, it's thought that Yom Teruah is when judgment is rendered, Yom Kippur is when judgment is sealed, and Hoshana Rabbah, uh, the seventh day of Sukkot is when judgment is delivered. Remember last week when I talked about the three times that the average defendant would appear before the judge in a criminal proceeding? Well, that derives from Yahuwah's judicial process in the Shemayim. The key is that you must thirst for righteousness in order to drink from the waters that Yeshua is offering. 
While Babylonian beverages can satisfy the thirst and the lust of the flesh, the righteous thirst for living water. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, righteousness is not some abstract idea that we cannot understand. Abram believed or trusted in Yahuwah, and it was accounted to him as righteousness, Zedekah. And uh, he did what he was instructed to do by Yahuwah. That, that was his righteousness. And nothing has changed. The same holds true for Israel. In Deuteronomy it says, Then it will be righteousness, Zedekah, for us, if we are careful to observe all these commandments before Yahuwah our Elohim, as he has commanded. We've been given instructions through the Torah intended to keep us in the way of righteousness. In fact, the Psalms state that all your commands are righteousness. Zedek. When Yeshua made his declaration on Hoshana Rabbah, he was fulfilling Psalm 98.2, which declares Yahuwah has made known his salvation, Yeshua. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. Once we understand where we look for our salvation, we are then ready for the future. At the end of the seven days of Sukkot, after Hoshana Rabbah, we come out of those temporary dwellings on the eighth day assembly, Shemini Atzeret. Leviticus 23.36 uh, says, For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. On the eighth day you shall have a Mikra Kodesh, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. It is a etzeret, and you shall do no customary work on it. The eighth day celebration actually lands on day 22 of month 7. And I've mentioned this before, that the final letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the Ta. Uh, in the ancient script, it's represented by an X. It's a mark of the covenant, the 26th letter of the alphabet, the end. So the eighth day is also the 22nd day. It is the end that leads to new beginnings. And we rehearse the time when we come out of these temporary dwellings and are given new bodies and a new home. We accept the invitation to visit the king and our way is no longer blocked by walls, doors, veils, and cherubim. The eighth day is the culmination and the fulfillment of the covenant. And that's why the mark of the covenant is etched into the flesh of every male born into the covenant on the eighth day of their life outside of the womb. It is a reminder that this covenant culminates on the eighth day. While our future plan lies here on earth, I don't doubt that our renewed bodies would allow us to venture forth into the cosmos. Uh, in fact, we will need that ability to visit the throne room in the Shamayim. It's too bad that all those exoplanetary scientists don't realize that. Uh, all of our hope for exploring the heavens rests with the one who offers us salvation. Someday Yeshua will send his messengers to gather us with him in the clouds. Uh, that's only to consummate the relationship with his bride so that they both can reign over his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven or the Shamayim. Uh, he's coming to gather us in the Father's good time. Our only job is to be found ready and doing. Uh, remember what Yahuwah said through Isaiah, keep justice and do righteousness for his salvation is about to come. It is coming to this land. So if you're interested in the land, if you aren't interested in the land, I encourage you to get interested and make, make no mistake. I'm not talking about adoring the modern state of Israel as we see some people do. I'm, I'm talking about the land that Yahuwah once called home and will call home again in the future. In fact, you should view it as your home if you hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's presently being occupied by people who generally reject the Messiah and are not in the renewed covenant. The land is currently being profaned and defiled, but it's still his land, and that's why it must be renewed. 
I know people who were so determined to get to the land that they lost sight of why they had the desire to be here. They were willing to convert to Judaism and deny the Messiah simply to gain citizenship in the modern state of Israel. And of course, the Jewish state was happy to oblige. Uh, that's the opposite extreme of those who claim to love Jesus but have no desire to dwell here. Uh, it's important that we always stay focused on Yeshua and stick to the plan and not get ahead of ourselves or Him. On that note, uh, there's an interesting story found in the book of Yasher that describes when some warriors from Ephraim tried to enter the land from Egypt. Uh, before the appointed time. It says, uh, at that time, in the 180th year of the Israelites going down into Egypt, there went forth from Egypt valiant men, 30,000 on foot from the children of Israel, who were all of the tribe of Joseph, of the children of Ephraim, the son of Joseph. For they said the period was completed, which Yahweh had appointed to the children of Israel, in the times of old, which he had spoken to Abraham. And these men girded themselves, and they put each, other, each man his sword on his side, and every man his armor upon him, and they trusted to their strength. And they went out together from Egypt with a mighty hand. But they brought no provision for the road, only silver and gold, not even bread for that day did they bring in their hands, and they thought of getting their provision for pay from the Philistines, and if not, they would take it by force. And these men were very mighty and valiant. Uh, one man could pursue a thousand, and two could rout ten thousand, so they trusted to their strength and went together as they were. And as they directed their course toward the land of Gath, and they went down and found the shepherds of Gath feeding the cattle of the children of Gath, and they said to the shepherds, Give us some of the sheep for pay, that we may eat, for we are hungry, for we have eaten no bread this day. And the shepherds said, Are they our sheep or cattle, that we should give them to you, even for pay? So the children of Ephraim approached to take them by force, and the shepherds of Gath shouted over them that their cry was heard at a distance. So all the children of Gath went out to them. And when the children of Gath saw the evil doings of the children of Ephraim, they returned and assembled the men of Gath. And they put on each man his armor and came forth to the children of Ephraim for battle. And they engaged with them in the valley of Gath, and uh, the battle was severe. And they smote from each other a great many on that day. And on the second day, the children of Gath sent to all the cities of the Philistines that they should come to their help, saying, Come up unto us and help us, that we may smite the children of Ephraim, who have come forth from Egypt to take our cattle and to fight against us without cause. Now the souls of the children of Ephraim were exhausted with hunger and thirst, for they had eaten no bread for three days. And 40,000 men went forth from the cities of the Philistines to the assistance of the men of Gath, and these men were engaged in battle with the children of Ephraim, and Yahuwah delivered the children of Ephraim into the hands of the Philistines. And they smote all the children of Ephraim, all who had gone forth from Egypt. None were remaining but ten men who had run away from the engagement. For this evil was from Yahuwah against the children of Ephraim, for they transgressed the word of Yahuwah in going forth from Egypt before the period had arrived, which Yahuwah in the days of old had appointed to Israel. And of the Philistines also there fell a great many, about 20,000 men, and their brethren carried them and buried them in the cities. And the slain of the children of Ephraim remained forsaken in the valley of Gath for many days and years, and were not brought to burial. And the valley was filled with men's bones. And that's Yasher 75, 1 through 19. Of course, quoting that, I'm not endorsing Yasher as scriptures. It's just an interesting uh, piece of information that uh, really has a lesson involved in it. It's a sad story because uh, they wanted to go to the promised land, but they presumed much. Uh, they presumed they could buy or plunder their food, and they presumed that they could enter the land based upon their own calculations, their own determinations which ended up being wrong 
they weren't on Yah's time. They presumed, they presumed wrong and they got themselves killed. They needed to wait for Moses to come. Instead, they tried to fight the giants and the people of the, the, the Philistines, the people of Gath, in their own strength. And this is probably why the children of Israel were so afraid uh, of the giants when the ten spies gave the bad report. Uh, they remembered the stories um, of the ten, actually, <laughs> uh, from Ephraim that gave the bad report of what happened in the uh, Valley of Gath. Uh, the battle took place in Gath, the home of a giant such as Goliath, and it's very likely that they fought in you know, the Valley of the Giants, which is now called the Valley of the Giants, Emek HaRaphaim, that you can visit to this day. And, and I believe this is the imagery presented uh, to Ezekiel in his vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones, when the house of Israel will uh, finally be restored into an exceedingly great army. So, and we read about that in Ezekiel 37. So the message for today is that Yahuwah has it all under control. We cannot and should not presume, and we must place our trust completely in him. If we're not walking in his timing, our preps won't save us. And currently, we're in the midst of a wedding rehearsal, and the righteous are commanded to rejoice. Therefore, that is exactly what we should be doing, no matter what's going on in the world around us. If you're observing this time, then you're among the righteous and have every reason to rejoice. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. That's Psalm 96, 13. Hag Samak, my name is Todd Bennett. I'm in Jerusalem celebrating the Feast of Sukkot in 2022, and I wish you a happy and joyous feast.